Hi, I'm Jeff Wasserstrom from the University of California, Irvine. And the talk I'm giving today is called Clothes Make the Nation, China and Globalization. I'm going to be using a look at clothing, particularly of powerful men over time in China, as a way to get at issues in discussions both of Chinese politics and of China's enmeshment in the world and global flows in different periods in the past. What I'm interested in trying to get beyond is two misleading ideas about China and globalization. One is the idea that globalization leads to a flattening of the world and a complete homogenization of differences between cultures and nations, which I don't think is an accurate way to think about globalization. And the other thing I want to get beyond is an idea of China as somehow exotic and separated off from global trends in a kind of permanently unique way. And that, I think, also gets things wrong about China. And what I want to suggest is a different way of thinking about China's enmeshment with the world in different places, and by extension about globalization in general. My starting point for thinking about this, one starting point came from this book cover, uh, my most recent book, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, which came out, the first edition, the cover is shown here, came out in 2010. And I like to say that while with many books, you don't want to judge the book by its cover, with this book, I think we came up with a cover that I'm pretty happy with the book being judged by, in the sense that the cover encapsulates some key things about um, the book itself. What I'm wrestling with in the book, as in a lot of my writing about China, is ways that China has and hasn't changed quite dramatically since the time that I first went there in the mid-1980s. The top part of this book cover shows a scene that is utterly unlike things that I saw in China in the mid-1980s, and utterly unlike things you would have seen in China 10 years before that. It's a scene of some young Chinese men at a punk rock concert, and the way they're dressed and the way they're acting is very much in step with the way youth in many different parts of the world were acting around the same time. This photograph was taken early in the 21st century at a time when China was culturally becoming very enmeshed in popular culture trends around the world. Now, the bottom part of the photograph shows members of the Chinese Communist Party all clapping in unison, presumably all agreeing with whatever has just been said or is being voted on. And uh, the conundrum that I wrestled with in the book and that I, a lot of people wrestle with um, of my generation in Chinese studies is trying to put these two halves of the cover together. And here's what I have in mind by that. When I went to China in the mid-1980s first, you definitely saw a political order that could be represented by the bottom photograph. The Communist Party was in control, and while there were some challenges to it, um, the way in which high-level politics worked was with one party um, and a kind of unified stance that we associate with Soviet, Soviet political structures in different parts of the world, Communist Party run states. What I thought, if I, if I tried to imagine, would there be a time when China would have scenes like the top scene, which, which you didn't see things like in China uh, in the mid 1980s, I might have said, if China moves to a point where you have that kind of freedom of expression and enmeshment with global youth culture, then it would likely be that the political system had changed, that you would not see a one-party rule and everybody on the same page politically in the bottom picture. So the conundrum about China now is that in many cultural and social terms, you have dramatic change, and yet in some institutional and political structures, you have continuity. So you have both the top part of the picture and the bottom part of the picture. And to give you an idea of how this contrasts with an earlier period, you have here an image of young Chinese, um, young Chinese during the Cultural Revolution, who you see all dressed identically, but all dressed in a way that wasn't similar to the way their age mates in other parts of the world were dressed. And you see them all on the same page, quite literally, looking at the little red book of um, Chairman Mao. And you have this notion of great conformity as opposed to individualism of expression, as you have symbolized by the punk rock image. So the question is, um, how do we get from a period of this kind of um, conformity to much more individual expression with a continuity of 
political conformity as represented by the bottom photograph uh, in that image. And the other thing that, um, that gives a kind of contemporary relevance to this is another sartorial related image that, um, that came out right after the second edition of my book, uh, China in the 21st Century, came out in 2013. This image um, suggests something that I hadn't thought about when I initially looked at, uh, when I initially began giving talks based on the cover of my book, which is that actually if you think about the bottom um, picture, that isn't a sign of complete continuity with the past of the Chinese Communist Party. Because in fact, just as young Chinese in, uh, during the Cultural Revolution were dressed differently from young people in other parts of the world, powerful um, men in China during the Cultural Revolution, as represented by Mao himself, were dressed very differently from powerful men in other parts of the world. And what you've seen in the transition from Mao to Deng Xiaoping and then to Deng's successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, who show up here, who look more like the images on um, the front cover of my book, is a shift of those powerful men. The Chinese political system may still be very, very different from the political system in the West, but the way in which the men who tend to wield power within it, and it is largely almost exclusively men, now are dressed in step with um, powerful men in many parts of the world. So the political system may still, um, in some senses, have changed much less than the cultural and social system, but at least some of the trappings or some of the cultural aspects of um, political representation have become, uh, as with youth culture, more in step with some globally circulating norms. So that you have Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao in this picture looking very much like their counterparts in the West or in Japan in terms of the way that they're dressed and presenting themselves. So the story even there about change and continuity in China is more complicated. That if we say there's been more continuity in politics than there has been in uh, popular culture, that's definitely true. But there have been elements of the political system that have also changed to be in step with broader things. And this, in thinking about um, this deeper meaning of those, those um, two pictures, I've been influenced by reading I've done on the history of globalization. In particular, a book that I find very inspiring by Chris Bailey, a historian of India and a world historian, called The Birth of the Modern World, in which he looks at changes during what he calls an earlier period of globalization, from the late 18th century to around the time of World War I. He says that saw a period of dramatically increased um, global enmeshment of different countries becoming more entwined than ever before, people of different parts of the world um, being more influenced by one another than ever in the past. And he talks particularly about an era of, of, uh, of rapid acceleration in globalizing trends that happened during several decades leading up to World War I. What he says happened during that period was not that the world became homogenized, that different countries lost their distinctiveness, but he says there was a process of uniformity that preserved and gave new meaning to distinction and difference that took place. And he uses as an illustration of what he means the shift from the late 18th century to the time around World War I when it came and how powerful men around the world dressed. He says that if you go back to, say, the 1750s, you find that powerful men in different parts of the world dressed in radically different manners from one another, utterly unreconcilable in terms, no shared code among those, um, those men in terms of their dress. You would have um, men in some uh, Western monarchical systems who would show their power by dressing in very elaborate kinds of costuming. At the same time, in the South Pacific and some other parts of the world, powerful men um, would be represented in part by a kind of ritual undress. So you had this wide variation in the way that powerful men um, dress. But if you flash forward to the early 20th century, you see certain codes, sartorial codes, having swept many parts of the world and brought people together so that powerful men um, from different places, if they converged upon one setting to take part in a meeting or simply to be in the same city, could recognize one another by such things as um, frock coats and top hats that would represent the diplomatic corps from many different parts of the world. 
difference might be marked, but it would be marked in subtler ways. For example, somebody wearing a particular insignia on this that, that would give this generic form of dress a distinctive local representation. In any case, that is the background of an earlier period of globalization um, that I'll be talking about as I move forward in time and looking at different moments when China has been more or less enmeshed in these kinds of um, globally circulating notions of uniformity and how it has stood apart at different points from that. And I'll use the example of dress. When the second edition of my book came out, I was pleased that I could retain the same cover photo um, because the continuity, uh, the, the contrast that was supposed to be represented by the cover in 2010 was still true in 2013. Um, so the, the cover still had, had balance. I was also, um, one thing that brought that home was that there was a political transition in China um, at the end of 2012 in which um, this is the new standing committee of the Chinese Communist Party that took power in 2012, the most powerful men um, in China. And you see this standing committee, the new standing committee, literally standing in front of a crowd, and they're dressed just as uniformly as in that, um, that earlier image. And again, they're dressed very much like powerful men around the world um, tend to dress in settings. There was one image that um, came out in 2013 um, that I thought was very interesting in uh, thinking about shared sartorial codes that now China's leaders are very enmeshed in. Um, here we see Xi Jinping and Barack Obama at what came to be known as the Shirt Sleeve Summit, a summit held when um, the two leaders met in California early in 2013. And this was supposed to be something that got away from the formality and the rigidity of many state visits between leaders of the two countries and allowed them to really get to know one another. And what I think this, this kind of, even in moving from a formal setting to an informal setting, the two leaders were dressing in parallel matched ways, shows just how far this process of uniformity even among leaders of very different political systems, is part of the global, um, the global symbolic language of politics um, in our own globalized era, which I would see as the result of another period of a great acceleration of globalizing trends. One other thing about globalization that I think people sometimes forget is there's an idea that the world is steadily moving toward greater and greater um, entwinement. But in fact, there are bursts of globalization that knit the world together um, far from places more than they ever were before. But there are also periods of checks on globalization and times when different parts of the world, major parts of the world, pull apart. And the Cold War could be seen as an era um, that strained or moved, pushed against some of the moves toward globalization that were prevalent in the period Bailey discusses. And we can see the late Cold War and especially the post-Cold War era as a period of a, a restarting and, a, and um, an acceleration again of globalizing trends. Okay, let's talk about China over this broad sweep of time, beginning with this image from um, um, during just, just as the period of the great acceleration of that earlier stage of globalization that interest Bailey was beginning. Just as the world was moving to countries presenting themselves to one another in, in ways that were more and more similar and powerful men around the world beginning to dress more and more similarly. This is an image of the first American president to go to China. He went as an ex-president, uh, General Grant, meeting with one of the most powerful men in China at the time, Li Hongzhang. And you see here, they are very clearly um, men from very different um, cultures and uh, seeming almost from different eras or different, um, different worlds. Their dress, while Grant was dressed in a way that an increasing number of powerful men around the world were beginning to dress that way, um, Li Hongzhang is dressed in a way that sets himself apart from um, most other powerful men in other parts of the world, expressing a part the uh, way in which China in 1879, when this photograph was taken, was much less, um, much less a part of the emerging uh, international order of World's Fairs and Olympics and also of, um, of, of 
financial system that was increasingly connecting different parts of the world. And it was very much stood apart. And Lee Hong Zhang's dress helps mark him as uh, being apart. So this was during Graham's trip around the world in 1879. And um, while I haven't said much about how powerful women dress, the moves toward um, homogenization or uniformity among um, women, elite women, has never been as dramatic as that among elite men. But there's also been a tendency over time for more and more of uh, um, women with, with some kind of power to dress more like one another. And so I'll show you an image here of the Empress Dowager, the most powerful woman in China in the very early 20th century, meeting with a group of foreign women from um, the diplomatic corps. The foreign women are dressed in ways that are fairly similar to one another in various ways. And the Empress Dowager here represents a very different kind of sartorial code and um, grammar. Now, of course, monarchs often dress distinctively, but still, I think you would see a similar disjuncture even at different levels of uh, elite society. Elite women in the West and their, their styles were being copied by other parts of the world were being more um, moving toward more homogenization or more similarity, at least, with, di with subtler differences, while China stood apart. After the 1911 revolution, which ended the imperial system in China and made China a republic for the first time with a president rather than an emperor, you saw also these shifts toward being somewhat more in step with uh, main trends in the world in the forms of dress. This is a picture of Sun Yat-sen, the first provisional president of the newly formed um, Republic of China with his wife, um, uh, Song Cheng Ling, and you see them dressed in ways that would be mutually um, recognizable in many of the capitals of the powerful nations of the world at that time. He's not dressed that differently from how a powerful man in London or Paris or New York would be expected to dress at that time. Now, Sun Yat-sen didn't always dress in that um, generically international way. He also developed a distinctive form of national clothing um, for the new nation. He thought that a new nation should have some things that were distinctive to it. And he developed um, what came, became known as the Sun Yat-sen suit. And then after that, uh, became more known around the world as the Mao suit, because um, Mao, as leader of the Communist Party, adapted some elements, uh, adapted the Sun Yat-sen um, suit to become the national clothing um, for the People's Republic of China. So in other words, we should keep in our minds an idea of Sun Yat-sen as a Chinese leader who in certain settings dressed very much like leaders around the world were dressing and also had uh, association with a distinctive form of clothing that marked um, China's difference. And there too, we have a, within a globalized world, there's never complete homogenization. There are always ways in which people mark their difference, often in um, something like a national dress within uh, broader codes. This is a, an image of Sun Yat-sen's successor as leader of the Nationalist Party. Sun Yat-sen was edged out of the presidency, um, but he remained an important political figure as the leader of the Nationalist Party, which was one of the main competitors for power throughout um, throughout um, the period, um, the 1920s through the 1940s, they competed with the Chinese Communist Party to figure out which would be a control of China's future. In the end, the communists defeated the nationalists, and the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek retreated to Taiwan, and um, Chiang Kai-shek stayed ruler there until his um, death in the mid-1970s. Here we see Chiang Kai-shek marrying Song Mei Ling, uh, who was actually the sister of Song Ching Ling, Sun Yat-sen's um, wife. And here you see a wedding in which their clothing um, could be largely interchangeable with that of elite, an elite man and woman being married in many parts of the world at that point. This is um, Chiang Kai-shek's wife, Song Mei Ling, meeting who had that in the 1940s um, when Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists had taken control of China. 
Um, she was the most powerful woman in China, and she was meeting with the most powerful woman um, in the United from the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt. And you see, they are not dressed identically. Um, Song Mei Ling is wearing, in this case, uh, distinctively Chinese cut of clothing. But there are things that mark them as, if we think about it, moves toward uniformity with difference within them. The um, the shared fur and the way they're they're sitting together suggests that um, that these are women of a similar type with specific differences uh, between them. By the late 1940s, after World War II, when um, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists were in power, they were fighting a final civil war um, with the communists that would determine um, China's fate. But at this point, um, the nationalists were sending representatives to international bodies that were trying to um, come together to figure out what a post-World War II global international order would be like. And in this setting, this is from the Dumbard and Oaks um, conference, you have a Chinese member of the delegation who at this point is the Chinese members of the delegation here are uh, together with American and British members of the delegation. And the only way you can tell who is from which country is by looking very closely at facial features. There's nothing about the way they're dressed that distinguishes them there. And this was a vision of a potential tightly globalized order that was strained um, by the Cold War very quickly. After 1949, when the communists emerged victorious, Mao, who's shown here um, on the right, presented himself as being part of a lineage that was international, but was not of this generic uh, capitalist globalization that was being represented um, by the images you just saw. And this was even marked um, in part sartorially. Here, we see him um, presented as continuing a lineage that goes from Marx and Engels at the left to Lenin um, as the key early interpreter of Marx and Lenin's idea, of Marx and Engels ideas, followed by Stalin. And Mao is shown particularly close to Stalin, the two living representatives of um, that tradition in, in the biggest um, the biggest powers of that time. And they're marked together, you can see, sartorially by the shared red on their collars. So this was a way of saying, yes, Mao had things in common with other political leaders around the world, but it was of a specific kind of other part of the world, a pivoting toward um, the world of state socialism as opposed to the international capitalist order represented by Dumbart and Oaks and meetings with British and American and other European, uh, Western European leaders. When um, Mao led um, the People's Republic of China, he dressed in ways that set him clearly apart from um, the leaders of the Western capitalist world, who at that time were dressing in um, the coats and ties. His distinctive form of clothing, he would often meet with leaders from other parts of the socialist bloc who would also often dress in ways that set them apart. Here he is meeting with Che Guevara in che, during Che Guevara's visit to China in 1964. We're back in some ways um, to the era of, um, only in a very specific way, to the era of um, Grant and Lee, uh, General, uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Lee Hong Zhang. Um, in a period of, of Chinese men dressing in a way that set them apart, certainly from, from American men, powerful men. And we see um, a famous image of that was the first time that an American president, a sitting American president, um, went to China in the 1970s now, rather than the 1870s in that last image. We have Nixon meeting Mao, and once again, they seem to come from two, uh, not just from, from different countries, but in a sense from different political orders as marked um, by many things, including their clothing. Now, we often think that when Mao, um, when Mao died, and especially after Deng Xiaoping took power in 1978-79, uh, that China began to move much more, uh, that Deng Xiaoping began to experiment with free markets and to move toward a way of tempering the differentness of China, say, representing a different kind of, Part of a different kind of international order to being one that was more connected 
to the West and began to um, share more with it. But the difference did not come instantly, at least in the sartorial mode. So that when here we have Nixon um, meeting with Madame uh, Mao, looking um, again very different sartorially. But when we have um, Deng Xiaoping, Mao's successor, coming to the United States, we still have Deng Xiaoping and his um, interpreter in this picture seeming to come from a very different kind of um, sartorial world than Nixon and um, Jimmy Carter. The most important moment in Deng Xiaoping's famous visit to the United States in 1979 came when at a Texas rodeo he uh, donned a cowboy hat. This became the most important photo op of um, the visit. It showed a kind of puckish side to the new Chinese leader that was um, endearing to a lot of Americans. But I think it also um, showed in a way that even though they might still be dressed in um, a way that set them apart, Deng Xiaoping was willing to experiment with different parts of different orders, um, including economically, but symbolized here um, by the donning of a hat, just to see what it was like to wear one, that seemed to fit very much with um, an American view, a hope about China as becoming more, um, more connected to the international order that the United States was part of, and even um, reignited part of an ongoing American fantasy about a China converting to our ways, in some ways represented here by the donning of the, the cowboy hat. By the time we get to Deng Xiaoping's successor, Jiang Zemin, when he came to the United States and met uh, with Bill Clinton, here you have them sitting together dressed in very matched ways, showing that even though China is still run by a Communist Party at this point, in some ways they've adopted many more of the forms um, that bring them in step with many other parts of the world, including the United States. And here you see that move from Mao to Deng to Jiang Zemin represented again by an image that looks at um, a shared lineage. So here you have this image um, can be read as saying Jiang Zemin is part of a distinctively Chinese uh, political lineage, and yet he is now um, representing a part of that political order that in its forms is more like um, the one that people in, other, in the capitalist world were familiar. And it wasn't just clothing that brought things that way. I've been, I've been stressing clothing as, a, as a, a nice metaphor for this. But another shift is that Mao was always represented, described most typically as Chairman Mao, Chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, emphasizing that. Deng Xiaoping um, also was, was described as a leader um, with distinctive um, terms for his power positions that were not um, similar to those that we were used to using in the United States. By the time we get to Jiang Zemin, though, he's described as the president of the People's Republic of China. So he's not just dressed in a way that is in step with our expectations, um, but he also has a, a title that's in step with this. Now, make no mistake, he was still the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. He was the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party as well as the president, but the emphasis on him in international settings of describing him as a president, when president and premier, prime minister and premier were the most commonly used globally circulating terms for um, the leader of a political system, is I think a perfect example of um, what Bailey is talking about when he talks about moves toward uniformity, that do not do away with difference, but allow people from different settings to seem more um, mutually intelligible to one another in a way that Chairman Mao did not have a counterpart in the American system. Jiang Zemin is, by being described as a president, and that term is stuck with his um, successors, encouraged us to think about there being things that are similar about his position um, that, that, that gloss over to some extent the degree of difference. And I think that's part of what goes on in globalization. Here we have an image of Xi Jinping, the current president, 
of the People's Republic of China, as well as the leader of the, the Chinese Communist Party, and Vladimir Putin. And so here we've moved all the way from a time when the leader in Beijing and the leader in Moscow were dressing and having names for themselves, uh, for their positions of power that set them apart um, from, from the Western world, to one in which we, they're both represented as presidents, and they're both dressed in ways that would seem at home in Whitehall or in Washington. And yet, both of them are still part in different ways of lineages that connect them to very different political orders, but this, um, in some ways, papers over those, um, and we see them together there. Here we see um, a picture that I can't resist, um, just because of its, for lack of a better word, goofiness, including in um, lectures, that shows Jiang Zemin together with George W. Bush dressed in very unusual ways for powerful men around the world, but ways that are quite usual for a particular setting that is going to be one that I would argue um, draws attention to something else important about globalization. During globalization, even though in certain ways far-flung nations of the world are brought together into very capacious international systems while maintaining their distinctiveness as nations within that system, globalization also finds the creation of new regional organizations that bring together several nations together in ways that stand apart from several from other groups of nations. This picture was taken during the APEC uh, summit meeting held in um, Shanghai in 2001. At the end of these APEC meetings, which are of leaders of Pacific Rim economies that are seen as composing a regional, a regionally integrated bloc, at the end of the meetings, typically, though not always, the leaders who have come together there shed their ordinary clothing and don clothing that are supposed to represent the distinctiveness of the one nation that they have visited to hold the meetings, but also represent, by them all dressing together that way, the distinctiveness of that group of countries that make up um, the summit group um, as a unit that has the, whose members have something in common with each other that set them apart as a group from the rest of the world. Here's an image of a larger group of um, the leaders coming together um, there, and this is one setting where male and female um, uh, leaders tend to adopt um, a more similar set of clothing at the end to go together here. Um, this is a shot when the meetings were held in Korea. There is something that, that evokes some kind of real or imagined distinctiveness of the country in which the event is being held. And we can think about um, this where you see, again, an example of uniformity that doesn't do away with difference. What's uniform is that every country is supposed to have some kind of clothing that an occasion like this can be worn to show um, the distinctiveness of that country. But of course, when the summits are held in a different place, the clothing will differ. When it was held in Mexico, there were donned ponchos and so forth. I've, I've shortchanged women, and I think it, it would be worth um, going with um, going into a whole separate lecture on how exactly um, female styles work into these issues of globalization, but there just tends to be more space um, left for women to represent distinctive things about a nation or a culture that sets it apart from others than there are um, for men. But at the same time, there are emerging codes that tend um, to have um, women in certain roles in many settings dressed. Similarly, and here I think we can see this with um, Xi Jinping meeting with one of his diplomat, one of his counterparts um, from Africa, and from and the two men are dressed in virtually identical ways. The two women are dressed um, differently. Um, Jiang, uh, Xi Jinping's wife, who's playing more and more of the role of a first lady, something that sort of um, takes to yet another level the move um, of going from a chairman of the Communist Party to a president um, with the expectation of a uh, 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 partner who plays a role. Um, she is dressed here in a kind of garb that would be familiar 
to um, to powerful women in, say, London or Washington. But um, her counterpart there is representing is wearing clothing that represents much more of a distinctive um, cultural or national difference. And that's a role that women um, there's more room for women to play in diplomatic settings than not always. I've talked a lot about the very particular thing of, um, of, of leaders and um, uh, presidents, and then most recently, first ladies. And one of the things before I leave that, even though this image takes us into a, a, another, another topic, is just to say that when the other thing to be said about, um, the other thing to be said about an image of Xi Jinping and his wife in that, uh, the image before, as a president and a first lady, is that this is, could be seen in part as the logical extension of a new development of post Mao China, but it was also a throwback to an earlier period of um, Chiang Kai shek and his wife, who were seen around the world very much um, like a leader and a first lady. Anyway, I want to get away from the most powerful segment of society elite to show some other realms in which clothing can represent. Uh, separation from international trends and enmeshment in them. And this is an image from 1950 showing um, the Communist Party set a, put out a comic strip that talked about the new order and all that was glorious about it. And one thing they celebrated was that in the new order, there was a, a legal system that was um, that gave everybody equal rights and um, and bless the world with peace and security. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why the, we can criticize that about the legal system. But here, I just want to focus on the clothing. Um, we have these um, smiling young people who are at a court, but the, the dress of the court personnel is quite military looking, which sets it apart from court courtroom personnel in other um, parts of the world. And judges in China throughout the Mao period and beyond tended to dress in military-looking um, clothing that set them apart from judges in other parts of the world. Now, the Chinese court system remains quite different from other court systems in many parts of the world. But now, as this image from a recent court, a rare shot inside a courtroom shows, the judges are now, at least in the, when it comes to form and symbolism, dressed very much like judges in other parts of the world. So this is another way in which China while um, the political and legal systems stay very distinctive and very different um, from the um, American one and from many others, has gone through changes in form that bring it um, more into step with the uniformity expected of this particular globalizing time. Another example of uh, kind of, or a good example of uniformity that doesn't overdo difference is the idea that increasingly around the world, um, in more globalized times, um, there are shifts toward using money that, while distinctive to a specific country, virtually always, or a distinctive region at least, um, ha is marked with things that say, this is money of a particular place, a particular nation. So here is a Chinese, um, Chinese bill that has Mao's um, picture on it. When you show an image like this, um, when I when I talk about Chinese money, um, one of the things that people in America often focus on is the fact that Mao is is on the money, and they they focus on the fact that this seems peculiar given how horrific some of the things that Mao did when he was alive uh, were, and also they sometimes imagine that this is a sign that China of uh, lack of change in China since an earlier period because they'll say Mao is still on the money there. But in fact, Mao wasn't on the money during Mao's own lifetime. Uh, I'll get back to the question of him having done horrible things and being on money. But his appearance on, um, on banknotes was actually a new thing in the post-Mao era, um, which was in part a throwback to Sun Yat-sen's appearance on money in an earlier period of um, of history. But here, here is what money, what bills look more like during Mao's own era. On the money at that time were not any recognizable historical individual. Um, in many other parts of the world, you would have either a sovereign on the coins and bills or famous specific individuals from a country at least. In China, you would have representatives of social and political groups. 
uh, or gender groups in, in this case as well. So the idea was the money, um, the money actually was another marker besides clothing that set it off. That yes, it looked like a bill that might be in another place, but the use of um, uh, not specific individuals was in fact one of the many things that, that set China apart. So in the post Mao era, with Mao um, going on to bills, it in fact, in a funny way, makes um, China's monetary code more comparable to an American monetary code, where we typically have the images of now dead um, leaders on our, our bills. Which leads to an interesting thing about the fact that Mao did horrible things. You would think that a country wouldn't want to have somebody on um, their money who was associated with really horrible things. In, in Mao's case, the, the terrors of um, the Cultural Revolution and um, the horrific famine of the Great Leap Forward. Um, now, it's true that the fact that he's on money in part suggests that in China there hasn't been as thorough a repudiation of um, some parts of this rule as, um, as there should be. But it also is a sign that Mao's uh, reputation in China, he's associated with more than just the, the most horrific parts of his time in power. He's associated with having, um, having helped the country stand up to foreign bullying is how partly he's remembered. He's remembered for things at different parts of his life. He's remembered in very complex ways. He's remembered by some as a leader who, for all of his failings, was more in touch with the concerns of ordinary people, at least early in his life, than China's current leaders may be. So it's, he's a complex figure who even some people who are absolutely appalled by some things represented by him and by some things that he did during his lifetime still have other feelings about him that would be more positive. So can we think of another setting in which somebody who is associated with really horrific things, um, but also perhaps with some things that some people think of more positively, could be used on money. We, as an American, at least, we don't have to look very far because everything I've said um, could be um, applied in one way or another to um, Andrew Jackson, who stays on our $20 bills now, even though many Americans now would say that what he did to Native Americans during his time in power was absolutely horrible, that he was engaged in um, horrific acts of violence, and we would now want to distance ourselves very much from, from parts of his legacy, including his support for slavery and his views of African Americans, and yet he is on uh, $20 bills, and if people were going to explain why that were in America, um, those who think we would say things like, well, for all of his failings, he was associated with a uh, political party that did some good things for the country, you can imagine. And some people would say of Andrew Jackson that he was more of a man of the people than many of the current um, leaders now, that he came from very humble circumstances and came to a point of, of ruling a country, which is something people in China now, some of them think that about Mao. Getting to something else that's removed from clothing, but I think um, I've already suggested can be used as an example of uniformity that does not um, do away with all kinds of difference, but actually allows for um, expressions of difference, but within commonly accepted codes. These are images of um, China's opening ceremonies to the Olympics. When China got to host the Olympics, you know, something it clearly didn't do during an earlier period of globalization, and at some periods um, China stood apart from um, this expression of the world coming together in one place. One of the things that it did, while it did the opening ceremonies to the Olympics were unique in the specifics of it and perhaps even setting new standards in levels of spectacle, what was not unique about it was this idea that, that what you did during an Olympic opening ceremony was um, call attention to the things, uh, to a specific parts of your history and national tradition. So this is something that every Olympic host is expected to do. And of course, the specifics of their cultural past and the, the things, the way that they present themselves to the world differs. But there's a shared grammar that there needs to be nods to the past, 
to distinctive past coming up to the country's present and perhaps giving some sense of its uh, future. And this was something that we saw in the Olympic, in the London Olympics four years after um, China's hosting, and we see, um, we will see in future ones as well. The Olympic ceremonies themselves, I think, are a way of showing that um, the world is coming together, but yet that the world is not completely flattened out. You see that um, not just in the fact there's an opening ceremony that, that draws attention to the distinctiveness of where that particular Olympics is being hosted, but also in the opening parade of teams from various countries, often who often of whom are dressed in distinctively different ways, though part of a single unified parade that suggests um, that they have something important in common. They're all teams from particular nations, but that they are different nations within that increasingly integrated um, global order. And that brings us back to the cover of the book as an example of both a new way, I think, of thinking of China as fully integrated into global um, trends in some ways. Um, Chinese youth are listening to many of the same songs that their age mates around the world are listening to. They're playing the same computer games, many of them, that their age mates around the world are. Um, there are some things that are quite distinctive to, um, to China that set them apart. In this case, in this case the punks are wearing, um, one of them is wearing a Mao t-shirt that might be worn by people in other parts of the world going to a similar concert, but on the other hand, might flag a distinctiveness, a kind of um, difference within um, uniformity. And in the political picture below, uh, rather than seeing that as a sign of how China isn't changing, I think it's a sign of how China has changed in at least some of the surface, um, the surface elements that go along with a political system that remains, as most political systems, are distinctive from those of other countries, but yet is being made increasingly intelligible in a shared, um, increasingly global kind of set of signals of political activity. And we shouldn't let um, we shouldn't let appearances of uniformity fool us into thinking there's complete homogenization. We shouldn't allow the fact that China's leader is um, now called a president rather than a chairman of the Communist Party to have us forget that much of the power of the current president comes from his role as leader of the party as opposed, and that we shouldn't forget that he's as, um, that he is not elected so much as selected as Richard McGregor, the Financial Times puts it nicely in his book about the Communist Party. Um, that American presidents are chosen through elections. Chinese presidents are chosen through selections in which it's a small group of powerful individuals um, within the party who choose who will next be the president. So we, we need to keep in our mind in a balance as we do with so many things about globalization, not overlooking the significance of moves toward commonality um, in forums and culture and economies and so forth, um, we shouldn't overlook the significance of those moves um, toward um, toward shared toward shared features and um, entanglement. Um, we shouldn't overlook those, but we also shouldn't let the forms blind us to the things that keep individual nations, including China, distinctive. And in, that leads to a more general challenge in thinking about China and the thing about many countries is finding place in our mind, both for the things that they have, in, have had in common and have in common in the present with other places, even that seem at first very different, um, to not over, overstate their exoticness and also not overstate the way in which even in very globalized times, individual cultures, individual places, individual nations maintain some very distinctive elements that set them apart from one another in these times.